Hi guys, Jordan with Motion Array. I think one of the most asked questions from beginning filmmakers is, how do I make my footage look more cinematic? There's a couple things that we want to clarify before we just jump into this list. First, what do we actually mean when we say that we want our footage to look more cinematic? Well, there's a couple different terms that we can interchange for this. Cinematic, high quality, professional, delicious looking, etc. But basically, the highest overall goal is to make your video look like what you see when you watch a feature film in a theater. But that's a really high bar that we just set for ourselves. How do we actually make that happen? Well, the truth is, is that it's not just a checklist that you tack off and automatically make this happen. It's a skill that you acquire over the course of your life and that you'll get better and better and better at the more time and energy you put in. But we've got to start somewhere. So today we're going to take a look at five tips to help you make your next video look and feel more cinematic. We're assuming that you're not actually working on a Hollywood set. So each of these steps is going to include practical application that you can apply towards your independent DIY low budget footage. So let's jump into it with number one, create depth. You may have heard before that shooting with a shallow depth of field is an easy way to make your footage look more cinematic fast. And that's because it does, it really works. But it's less because it's just this magical thing that makes your footage better, and more because it's a shortcut to giving your footage depth. Take a still frame from any of your favorite movies, and chances are, you're gonna see a shot that's not filmed at a crazy low f-stop like 1.5. But what you'll likely see is a shot that looks and feels similar because it has a foreground, a midground, and a background. And somewhere in there, your attention is being drawn to a point of focus. It gives you a place to look at while still being engrossed in the entirety of another world. So how do you take this and then apply it to your footage? Well, there's a couple of easy steps. There's a lot more to creating depth than just your aperture. Unless you're shooting against a flat wall, every shot you take will technically have depth to it, it's just harder to tell unless you have things in your scene scattered throughout the foreground, midground, and background. But you know what can really help to fill this out? Smoke. Or in our case, fake smoke or fog. This is a technique used all the time in Hollywood films, just in a variety of forms. This is also one of the many reasons why you see so many characters smoking in old films. That smoke gives depth. Another subtle, easy thing that you can do is just put something in front of your lens, just a little bit. This is one of the reasons why over-the-shoulder shots are such a preferred method of coverage. Because it's not only giving you context for where your characters are, but it's also creating a really simple foreground to give your shot more depth. But you can achieve the same effect by putting something else in front of the lens. It could be a random object in your home or just a tree branch if you're shooting outside. As long as it's not overly distracting, it likely won't take much to give the illusion of depth. And once you've put something in front of your lens, give your camera some motion. If you take a shot that's got a lot of depth to it and move your camera around, the result is that you're gonna get a lot of parallax. Parallax is when you have different elements in your scene moving around, but at different speeds because of their distance from the camera. We've got two lenses here that are stationary, and when we move the camera around, we can see that they move around at different speeds based on their distance from the camera. And lastly, one of the best ways to take this effect to the max is a tip from Steven Spielberg himself. Use vertical lines in your shot. What do I mean by vertical lines? Trees, street lamps, and literally anything else that could give a vertical linear shape. This is because when you're moving from side to side, vertical lines are the easiest way to display that you're moving horizontally. Putting together combinations of these tips will really help to sell your footage as being higher quality and higher budget. Number two, get your light right. Let's just stop for a second. Lighting is such a huge category that we don't think for a second we can do it justice in just a quick overview. So what we're gonna do is just offer a couple of quick solutions to help you get better lighting no matter what camera you're using. And step number one is to shoot in a flat profile. What this basically does is mutes everything in camera so that your sensor has a better chance of capturing a little bit better of a dynamic range. Dynamic range can broadly be thought of as the range between the maximum and minimum amounts of luminance able to be picked up by your camera at any given time. Some cameras can handle a wide dynamic range while others can only manage a smaller range at any given time. Take our word for it, dynamic range has a huge influence on how cinematic your shots look. There's a reason why higher budgeted cameras will typically have a much wider dynamic range. 
There's a lot of different flat profiles that you might have access to depending on what camera you're using. S-Log, C-Log, CineStyle, but the end goal is to give you more flexibility in the editing room. But that's really all you can do to influence your camera's dynamic range. The rest of what you have to do is just working with the lighting that you have in order to optimize it for whatever camera you're using. For this, we're gonna take advantage of the best, brightest, and most desirable light source you can actually get your hands on. And the best part is that it's free because it's the sun. Try and make sure that the exposure of your scene and the exposure of light on your subject's face are somewhat comparable. If you don't, you'll either get this crazy silhouette or a blown out background. If you're indoors, an easy solution is to have your characters face an open window and use the incoming light to light their face. If you're shooting outdoors, you'll likely run into a new problem, harsh, undesirable shadows. There's a couple different ways that you can go about solving this, but your end goal is really just to make the light softer by diffusing it. Using some sort of a scrim or white sheet to shine the sun through can be a really great DIY solution. And if you own one of these 5-in-1 reflectors, you've already got a really great portable pop-out solution for softening the light on your talent's face. This makes a huge difference to how your actors will look on camera. And speaking of reflectors, if you want that nice halo all around your subject, a great way to do that is by shooting your subjects back towards the sun. But this will likely leave their face in a lot of shadows, so use the reflector to bounce that light back into their face. You don't really need a fancy expensive reflector either. White paper, a white sheet, or anything that's light and reflective can help bounce the sunlight back to your subject's face. This way, even if your camera's dynamic range isn't crazy impressive, you can still have that awesome backlight without sacrificing seeing your subject's expression. It's a simple trick that can really infuse your footage with a lot more production value for little time, effort, or money. But if you have absolutely no gear to work with controlling your light, you can wait for the best time of day and let nature do its work for you. Wait for an overcast day so that the clouds make the natural sunlight really soft and beautiful. Or wait for golden hour, right after sunrise or right before sunset. This is the time of day when the sun is lowest in the sky and all the light is spread out a little bit more evenly over your scene. It also has that distinct and beautiful golden glow to it. There's been a few films over the years that have relied almost entirely on filming during golden hour. It's by far one of the least expensive ways to get great looking shots that even the pros still use. Number three, aspect ratio. This one is much more of a quick cheat than any of our previous examples. Basically, you can trick your audience into seeing your footage as more cinematic just by changing the aspect ratio. Traditional DSLR footage is shot at 16 by nine, and when you break that down to its lowest fraction, it comes to one to 1.78. But if you change it up to something even a little bit different, like one to 1.85 or one to 2.35, your audience will automatically see your footage as different. Think about the type of feelings that a shot like this brings up. Vertical footage tells you a lot about the video you're watching, and mostly that it doesn't belong on the big screen. But it's not just about the camera that you shoot with. Even if you take DSLR footage and format it the same as your vertical cell phone footage, you still get the same feelings associated with it. But thankfully, you can really easily get the cinematic aspect ratio and the feelings that go along with it with just a couple simple methods. You can add a crop effect to the top and the bottom of your footage. Add an aspect ratio overlay on the layer above, or actually shoot your footage in a more cinematic ratio to begin with. This last one will depend on the camera that you shoot with. Whatever way you slice it, that little change can actually make a perceivable difference to the way your audience takes in your shot. Number four, color correction. You knew this one was coming. Color correction is a huge piece to the puzzle. This is where you take the image that you captured and shape it into the final product in terms of light and color. But here's the tough part. It's all a matter of subjective opinion. Every situation is different because each different film is trying to give a slightly unique feel, tone, emotion, etc. But what I'll do is point you in the right direction to start giving your color correction a bit more of a traditional cinematic feel. I'm not a colorist, and this is just an overview of my own personal experience. But in general, if you wanna give your footage a more cinematic feel, you wanna give the color correction three things. Give it contrast, separate your points of interest, and also watch out for skin tones. To get started here, we have a sample clip that we want to make look more cinematic. This shot was taken on a flat color profile so that it can capture as much dynamic range as possible. And there's a couple of things that you want to bring out. Try and bring up as much contrast into the picture without losing information. A helpful tool to use is the waveform tool, which will help you to see the brightest and the darkest portions of your clip. The top here shows 100, and anything that's above that will just be pure white and indistinguishable. At the bottom is pure black at zero. So the goal is to separate out portions of our clip so that it fills out more of this graph, but also so that it doesn't clip above the top or drop below zero. As much as possible anyways. 
At the beginning of the video, you saw a clip go through a series of changes. But if we take a look at those changes with the waveform monitor, we can see that as the changes take place, our graph becomes more spread out, and it fills up more of the empty space. One of the easiest ways to get started with correcting in Premiere is the basic section of the Lumetri color panel. To adjust the overall brightness and darkness of your clip, use exposure and contrast to make very basic changes. Don't push it too much, because you can really fine tune this with your whites, highlights, shadows, and black sliders. Each of these will control their own respective sections of luminance so that if you want to separate out your dark scenes of your clip without influencing the brighter ones, adjust the shadows and blacks alone to give you that specificity. Next, add a bit of saturation to give life to your footage if you shot in a flat profile. Adjusting the white balance also really helps to give more character and realism to your color. What can really help is using the eyedropper tool and clicking on a space that's actually supposed to be white. And finally, using the hue saturation curve can give you control to enhance or pull back specific colors to give you the particular look that you want. This is one of the ways that we gave our sky and ocean a little bit more of a fantasy blue feel. But this is also where your skin tones can give you some problems if you're pushing your colors too much. Few things can ruin your film faster than making your human characters look not human. Our suggestion would be to learn how to use the HSL secondary section to isolate your skin tones and either adjust them separately or keep them out of some of the more extreme parts of your edit, especially if you want to push your color correction even further. Thankfully, we have a video where we went over this tool specifically to achieve a classic teal orange color grade, and the link to that can be found in the description below. It's important to remember though that the degree to which you're able to push your light and color in post really depends on how you shot it in camera. The closer you can get to achieving your look in camera, the happier you'll be in the long run. But wait, color correction is usually the last step of the process, right? So what did we miss? Well, our last point is actually not something you traditionally see on these sorts of lists. Number five is that it's all an illusion. Movie making is all a magic trick. Unless you're watching a documentary, those characters aren't real. The locations sometimes don't even exist. And if you were able to see behind the scenes, you'd see lights and equipment and people everywhere breaking the illusion. Because that's what a movie is. It's a big, expensive trick. So the last goal in all of this is to make sure that you don't remind your audience that they're watching a movie. I know that this is a bit of a catch-all category, and it could offhandedly include a lot of things like shoot at 24 frames per second, and have your shutter speed double your frame rate, don't get the boom in the shot, while others might take a little more time to get right. Like, don't neglect to get clean audio. Because otherwise, then your audience will know right away the whole production is amateur. Or even editing in a way that comes across as professional, which would require an entire course just in and of itself. But there's some pieces that don't often get recognized, like making sure that your audience is actually going to believe the story that you're telling. How many student films have you seen where the mafia boss is just played by a kid? It kind of breaks the illusion immediately. Even if you had the fanciest equipment, lighting gear, and camera work, you're not going to get your audience to believe that. So how do we actually break this down into a practical application? Well, there's a couple of different tips that we'd like to share, and the first is don't bite off more than you can chew. If you have a brutal fight scene where people are getting beaten up like something at a fight club, make sure that you actually have the capacity to make the blood and makeup look realistic. If you want to put your characters in some kind of a sci-fi world, make sure that you can actually build a world that makes me believe you're in the future. If you're not sure whether or not you can pull it off, do some test shots and see what you're capable of doing. If you don't think that you can make it look believable, scrap it and write yourself a solution to make it something that you can actually do. If you've got a character who's a millionaire, it's way easier and cheaper to just show them throwing around prop money rather than having them riding around on their own private jet. Creativity is key here. This last point is all about writing smart and making sure that whatever you choose to do, it's something that you're actually able to produce at a high level. If you're just starting out, my suggestion would be to start small, one location with a small amount of characters, and over time, as you start to get more and more comfortable, branch out and get more bold. The last thing I'll leave you with is a situation that I got to see play out recently. A while back, my wife and I shot a short film and released it on YouTube. Nothing crazy. But one year later, we had the pleasure of showing that same film to an audience in a movie theater. What happened was, I was blown away by how much more professional it felt just being in that awesome situation. Nothing was changed about the film, it was just given the illusion that it was bigger than it really was. Nobody needs to know how many people were on your set or how much money you spent on your film, if any. So use that to your advantage and make your audience believe it with every single frame that you show them. 
And guys, that's it. I really hope that you liked this video and that you found it at least somewhat helpful. And I'm also interested to know if you noticed that a lot of the example clips we used were actually stock videos from motionarray.com. We really believe that stock video doesn't have to mean cheap and corny. It can actually mean high quality and cinematic. If you're interested, we've listed all of the stock videos, music, and assets that we used in this video in the link in the description below. You can also check out all of our other tutorials over at motionarray.com. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can get 20% off your first month subscription at Motion Array. Use the links in the description below to claim your discount. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video.